We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela Dei Mater Alma Ad Pesemper Virgo Felix Teliporta Welcome everybody, Steve with Sense of Fidelity. I'm coming at you on the 3rd of April, year 2020. Again with Charles Colon, which we're still on lockdown. Greetings, Charles. Hello, hello, hello. It's... It looks eerily the same as last time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Down in the bunker with Charles Colon. You bet. Here in, the depths, <laughs> here in the depths of the lockdown, of the lockdown mother continent. <laughs> All <laughs> borders <laughs> sealed. When Mike, Michael Matt talks about he's in the uh, the catacombs. We'll just say we're in the bunker. <laughs> That's right. You can hear the hear the uh, the bombing overhead, but uh, <laughs> hey, no, it's, he's got the air raids going. <laughs> yeah, well, why not? I mean, here we actually have an air raid siren twice a month in Truwell, just to make sure that the system is still working. Yeah, and it always it always gets newcomers, but uh, it reminds me of my childhood. Because, you know, we always had the air raid. Uh, once a month, you'd have the air raid sirens work, uh, you know, practice. Uh, Just in case. <laughs> the wonderful, well, wonderful times. We did the drop and cover drills, you know, yeah. in case they drop the nuclear bomb. You know, your desk will protect you. Uh, <laughs> I learned a lot from phys about physics from that. Uh, I had no idea that even your desktop would even protect you from radiation. <laughs> it's amazing those desks back then. Oh, I'll tell you what; those things were enormous. They they were they were wonderful. I, if I if I could fit under one, I'd get one. <laughs> you know, I think I think it's probably the best way to deal with the virus is to huddle under your old school desk. There you go. It stop <laughs> tornadoes, nuclear war. There you go. Yeah, it, to take care of the virus, either that or have the Supreme Court uh, slap an injunction on the virus, <laughs> uh, find it unconstitutional. You know that. I mean, listen, our, our Supreme Court justices are able to change reality through their mind power, like exactly. the Spacing Guild and Doom. So I think I think you should just get rid of this virus, you know? Oh that's uh, No, couldn't hurt. At least we could get uh, Darth Vader Ginsburg out there again and uh, maybe... Uh... <laughs> oh, well, you heard about You heard what happened with her. Not yet. Well, no, no, she's been pre-buried as a precaution. In case she stuffs it during the plague. That <laughs> way, you know, the, yeah, she's pre -burned. I won't say anything. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's what they call the layaway plan. It, uh, <laughs> no, I, poor dear, she's hanging on for dear life. Little sure whether or not Mr. Trump is going to appoint him as president. <laughs> well, I, I'm serious. Stop. You know, got to be somewhere locked up and good fresh air in there high protection oh, yeah. area yeah she's 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 safe whatever else i mean she made out you think you're quarantined <laughs> that poor lady i mean she's probably like the you know john travolta is the boy in the plastic bubble you know, just, <laughs> you see poor ruth peter ginsburg you know. <laughs> feeding her through a cage <laughs> no, it's very sad. The things she does for her people of the Constitution. Yes. The it's it's really amazing. Uh, uh, well, we apologize for any Ruth Darth Vader Ginsburg fans out there, but uh <laughs> Well You know, you get you I'm sure she'd be the first to laugh at the idea of being the girl in the bubble. Uh, <laughs> I I don't know. I'm I'm worried about Eleanor Clift. You know, she uh, she's my favorite. 
the uh, she, you remember she was the lady on the McLaughlin group. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I don't know, I couldn't remember her. Yeah, yeah, she's the lady on the McLaughlin group. She's kind of a, kind of an old hag, but uh, I always would horrify people by claiming that I thought she was hot. And that that would get me some really interesting looks, oh, even from liberals. <laughs> even liberals would look at me, what? But, you know, she's uh, her one great claim to fame, other than her own career, is that she was the late lamented Montgomery Clift's uh, sister-in-law. So, that's a factoid you didn't know, but it's true. Okay. So, we learn so something I, new every day on the show, guys. That's why you should oh, tune in at your bunker yourselves. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Grab and for all of, you who are, all of you who are out there right now, uh, hiding in quarantine. <laughs> Read every book you have in your house. Watched every movie on Netflix twice, backwards, yep. and in different languages. Your DVDs are bent from overuse. <laughs> I bet they're melting. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, you know you're bored when you say uh, when you tell one of your kids, "Why don't you go annoy your brother?" <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, it's 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 great, kids. It's great. I uh, I think this is this is wonderful though because. Uh, one of the arguments I'm never going to have to hear again, as you know, I'm a, I'm a great fan of monarchy. Um, I cannot think of a single Christian monarchy that was ever able to shut down its population the way modern countries can. I, I, I never, I never want to hear people talking about the oppression in the past. I, 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 you know, give it a rest. Give it a rest or go back to your room. You know, it, 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 I, and don't get me wrong, for all I know, this is absolutely necessary. I don't know. But I will tell you this if it isn't absolutely necessary, and that ever becomes generally known. Great Scott. Uh, we got to have us in uh, what you would call a little bit of trouble here, you know. <laughs> Going to be a bit of a problem. And uh, as far as our beloved bishops go, them boys is really going to be in for a reckoning when we get out of this. Yeah. Because a ton of people will come away with the feeling that uh, the church really isn't necessary. It's certainly in no way a partner of the state. Yeah. It, uh, speaking now, I'm not speaking, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in terms of truths of the faith. I'm, just, uh, I'm speaking in terms of perceptive reality, perceived reality, I should say. Mm -hmm. What happened? At the end of the day... The church, which, uh, and I use this not just the church, but also the church as the little creatures, which in our country, have, we've always pretended was sort of a partner of the state, is shown to be no partner. It's kind of like the Rotary Club or any other voluntary organization that really doesn't mean all that much in the face of the state. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. I think the Rotary Clubs do a great job. But... When push comes to shove, we know who the real bosses are. Yeah, there was an uh, article on First Things. Is the church essential? Question mark. And it said this epidemic has uh, showed us what our essentials are. The pot stores, the liquor stores, the grocery yeah. stores. And the abortion mills. And the abortion mills. You got to murder them kids. Because if you ain't sacrificing a Moloch, he won't be giving your masters their, their goodies. It's all about health. No, I mean, and again, uh, we were talking before the show, but if after this, any bishop or even the Holy Father presumes to persecute traditionally minded people, you know what, pal? Why don't you go hide from a virus? Because that's about all you're capable of doing. Go away. I mean, they have really destroyed any claim they had to the uh, the allegiance of the unperceptive. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that devout Catholics, knowledgeable Catholics know that none of this stuff really affects reality. The Pope is still the Pope. The bishops are still the bishops. The problem is that they often have behaved as though they weren't aware of it. Mm -hmm. And now... For the large number of Catholics who are badly catechized, B 
because of the actions of the hierarchy over the past several decades. They will, I think a lot of them, they will shed the church as easily as they'll shed a coat. Because when push came to shove, it turned out they didn't need the sacraments. Now, yes, some of us can make distinctions and understand that that's actually not true. But a lot of us aren't like that because we were formed by the people that are running the show now. Mm-hmm. And they're not the smartest. No, 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 no. Because if they were smart, they would have a thought to self-preservation. Do they really think they're going to get any money after this? I mean, I know priests, quite a few of them actually, in different places all around the world, who have gone through hoops trying to get the sacraments somehow or other in some way or other to their people, provide some kind of service to their people. In a few cases, they have been punished severely, if not by the state, then by their own hierarchs. Mm -hmm. Well, people like that will probably find they can still, uh, you know, get dinner afterwards. But the rest of them? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, you were discussing this earlier. It's one thing if you know, for instance, that your priest every day is going to Mass mm-hmm. and offering a uh, an online Mass and maybe setting up some sort of weird way whereby you can hear confessions drive by or in the window or, or some some weird thing or maybe doing Masses outdoors or whatever, whatever he's doing. Uh, people like that, at least some of their people will still come up with the dough. But I guarantee you, if your church has been closed, there have been no confessions, no masses, no nothing, no attempt to keep you somehow involved. And all you get from them is a, a letter requesting money. Uh, No, oh, yeah. yeah, that's a hard, hard hurdle to do, especially if you're in an area where you're it's shut down and only twenty have died. Yep, and if that, I, I, I hate to say this, ladies and gentlemen, but I've said this in the very beginning. Uh, either this thing will be bad enough to have justified all of this, which would be very bad for all of us, or it won't be. And if it isn't. If it's overkill, well, there's going to be hard rains that are going to fall, both in church and state. And it's interesting to me also, again, we were discussing this, that our Presidente uh, has very skillfully kept himself out of the line of fire. Because, I mean, constitutionally, this is the kind of thing the states are supposed to deal with anyway. Yes. But how often has that stopped a federal government from doing anything? Instead, he's abided by the Constitution, but made the resources of the federal government available to any state that wants them. So he's got the best of both worlds. If it turns out it's as bad as uh, as predicted, as said, as claimed, the boy backed up the state governments uh, to the, with everything the feds had. Mm-hmm. And if it turns out the whole thing is somewhat less than that, it's in the hands of the governors. You know, I just gave them the support they said they needed. They're your governors. You you deal with them. Yeah. I saw a couple of governors crying about that, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean but the Hoy Ploy don't know don't know that. They look at they say they're we used to say during Obama's reign, say they're hell, uh, our Obamas and Hell Baracks to put their prayer <laughs> mask towards Mordor. They don't look at the state governments, they don't Look at most politicians, local ru- local governments running in the state. State house guys run unabated for years, decades. No one knows their state constitution. Or hey, nope. what is that? Well, see now they're getting a crash course in civics. Yes, and uh, it's interesting. My uh, my brother's with the state guard in California, and they've been called up. And that's it's it's interesting to watch because. Uh, all sorts of mechanics that haven't worked in a long time, if they've ever worked, are being called into play. And it, it's, it's, it's been interesting to watch. One of the things, for instance, people say that um, um, 
the Trumpster federalized the National Guard. He did not. He did not federalize the Guard. What he did was he made federal funding available for the Guard's operation. But the National Guards of uh, all 50 states remain securely under the control of their governors. Yeah. So... Yeah. I told that to somebody. I said, yeah, your governor is the commander in chief of your National Guard. What? That's right. Yeah, he he is right now. The man sitting in the state house is the your point man. And just as the EU has devolved magically into a uh, uh, collection of of countries again, mm-hmm. with all the borders sealed, so too once more the United States are. Yes. The United States. Everyone thinks we're one big blob like Russia, but 50 states, a.k.a. countries. Yep, 50 and, sovereign states. Yeah, united by united each other in one document. That's why you have state borders. <laughs> that's right. Now that's why you have different, that's why you even have different license plates. Yes. That's one of the most disturbing things, you know, for a Californian leaving California is that you see all those out-of-state license plates. Yeah. It's very upsetting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't get it. Why are, there, why are all these out-of-state license plates? <laughs> well, there are reasons for that. Well, yeah, what are they? Well, you're, you're actually not in California anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, I know that, but why are there all these out-of-state license plates? Here's well, <laughs> it... it you know, one of one of the uh, peculiarities of speech in LA in the LA area, which is, is it peculiar to us alone, nobody else speaks this way. And mind you, it's one of the few ways you could tell that I've lived in California most of my life, because my uh, accent, I have to say, is not as Californian as you might think. But like everybody else raised out there, I could I use the definite article when talking about freeways. The 101, the 110, the 5. Nobody else does that. And the, the reason why is because when I was a boy, they all had names. They didn't have numbers. Mm-hmm. So the 5 was the Golden State. And the, uh, the uh, 101 was the, uh, what was the 101? Gosh, I, I'm really going. I'm going batty. Uh, that happens when you're inside those walls all the time. Yeah, that's probably true. The 110 was the Pasadena Freeway, uh, north of of downtown, and it was the Harbor Freeway, south of downtown. Uh, oh, I know the uh, the uh, the 110 was the uh, the the 101 was the down in our part of it. It was the Foothill Freeway. Um, was that right? No, it's not right. It was the Hollywood Freeway. The 101 was the Hollywood Freeway. Um, the Foothill Freeway was um, the 101 going out my way. And there was the Santa Monica Freeway. And so it was. Well, all those now have numbers. The 10 is the Santa Monica Freeway. They all have numbers uh, today and all that. But we continued after the, the numbers came in, we continued to say the. Uh, yeah. So the five, the 101, the 10, and so on. So that's uh, absolutely useless information that you can share with people if they want to fit in when they come to LA. Because if you say, do I take 110? Huh? He means, should he take the 110? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just bear that in mind. I don't want to give the impression that we're not very bright. <laughs> Never would have thought that in one minute. <laughs> no, no. No, I I, uh, I I have to tell you, though, this we're, we're miles away from the what I was thinking about, of talking about. But uh, uh, I remember when I was, uh, oh, gosh, I was in college, and this blonde girl who had a, a real California accent, and, and, and she was – she was like really into stuff, you know, she, yeah. Anyhow, we were having a conversation and like I said to her, cause I mean, I said, I, I forget what it was. I told her about something or other that had happened. 
And she said, oh, yeah, if that were important, I'd have heard about it. <laughs> and, you know, that, that stuck in my head for the rest of my life. If that were important, I'd have heard about it. Yeah, yeah. And the four sad years, thing was... Hmm? Four years of Uber driving with majority of uh, California riders, I understand what you just said. Ah, <laughs> I heard that. Well, <laughs> then, you, then you know. I mean, it's a very unique mentality. Oh. But and the funny thing is, when that happened, I realized I had a very a re a true love-hate relationship with uh, L.A., I really did, because most cities, people have love-hate relationships with them in the sense that they hate them as much as they love them, but for different reasons. Uh, in L.A., you can love it and hate it for precisely the same reasons. And so when that girl said what she said to me, part of me just wanted to smack her upside the head. You know, how stupid and self-centered are, but the other half was like, isn't she sweet? She's so L.A. I'll bet she hasn't had a real thought in years. I just love that. Well, and, and I realized that I had a love-hate relationship with the place. And I do. You know, but uh, don't, get, don't get me wrong, though. It's not all stupidity by any, by any stretch. There are some very, very brilliant people out there. So about it. I, uh, I belong to an organization called the L.A. Breakfast Club, mm -hmm. which is about 97 years old. It goes back to the 20s. It meets every Wednesday morning for breakfast. Well, of course, while I've been in Austria, I haven't gotten any of the meetings, oddly enough. But last Wednesday, we had a virtual meetup. <laughs> because, of course, they can't meet during the frost again. <laughs> That's an old joke. That's a really old joke. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not happy I, I told it. But... The Pringles are getting to you. Yeah, yeah, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But I do I do have something to speak about, um, although it's completely unrelated to much of anything, except perhaps that uh, I did write The Life of Kaiser Karl for uh, 10 books. And, of course, I'm sitting here in the middle of the old Habsburg Empire. And yesterday, April 2nd, was the birthday of Charlemagne. Uh -huh. And, if that weren't enough, Good Friday and Holy Saturday are coming up. Now, I know what you're thinking. What, do we, what does any of that got to do with itself? Glad you asked that question. <laughs> Have you ever seen a pre-1955 missile? I've seen it, but I haven't gone through it the whole thing, no. If you do, you'll find something very strange in the uh, uh, prayers for uh, Good Friday and uh, Holy Saturday. You'll find in the Good Friday collects, you know, well, you will find, much to your surprise and shock, a prayer for the emperor. Mm -hmm. And they're not talking about Star Wars. Then you pick up the, uh, you, you go to Holy Saturday, and during the blessing of the new fire and the candle, the Preconium Pascale, or the exultet, the long song that the priest sings, you'll find a prayer for the emperor. And again, it's not for Star Wars and Palpatine. I know that's very shocking. You ever wondered about that? No, not really. Well, it's all right. I don't care. I'll tell you anyway. I've got lots of time. So do you. So do our wide drive viewers. We've all got time. I got time. I mean, we're all going to be able to learn such trivia about everything. It's, it's going to be amazing. Well, those prayers for the emperor uh, were actually very, very important once upon a time. Uh, until 1806, they were said all over the world. They continued to be said in Austria until 1918. They continue, and they were said for a period in France in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. So that's kind of peculiar stuff. Worse yet, if you look at the Byzantine liturgies, the older ones, the older versions, you'll find all sorts of prayers for the emperor. 
What could all of this mean, one wonders? Well, glad you asked that. Mm -hmm. I'm even gladder I asked it. <laughs> it means I can answer it. You can read my mind. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> it's, it's just one of the many skills I've picked up and, you know, all that. The origin of all this good stuff, historically speaking, goes back to Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. You know what happened on Maundy Thursday? There's some feet washing. Ah, there was feet washing. And that's actually an important point. You bet. For reasons I'll explain in just a second. But several things were established on Maundy Thursday. The Mass, mm -hmm. the Catholic priesthood, mm -hmm. you know, small things. It was the first transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond that, something else happened. And that was... Remember that our Lord, Jesus Christ, was not just the second person of the Holy Trinity incarnate by the Virgin Mary in flesh, not just the Savior of the world. It was all of that, but it was something else. He was, in fact, the legitimate and rightful heir by blood of King David, mm -hmm. of the Davidic monarchy, as it was called. Mm -hmm. And he did something very unusual. In fact, the only time it's ever happened before or since that night of Monday, Thursday, he united the Davidic kingship with the communion of the church. Mm -hmm. And so the kingship of Christ, in a very real sense, became incarnate. And Catholic monarchy was born that night. And that is why, uh, up until relatively recent times, one of the major features of the year at any Catholic royal court or imperial court was the washing of the feet by the king and the emperor. Uh, and that was done you know, in France up until uh, the king was overthrown in 1830. It was done in Austria until 1918, in Spain until 1931. Mm -hmm. uh, every Catholic monarch did the washing of the feet. The queen today no longer does the foot washing. That went out with George the First, but she still has the banquet for the old, the poor old people that went along with it, hmm. and gives out what's called Maundy money to the elder folks so invited. All right, so that's a very important point. Catholic kingship, Catholic monarchy was like the foot washing that was such a central ceremony to it. A ministry of service, to use a modern-sounding phrase. Um, because Catholic kings, although we surrounded them with ritual and ceremonial, they were not like the pagan kings who were seen as being worshipful in and of themselves. Or presidents today. Or stars, you know, movie stars. Or sports figures. or well, Anyway, the point is, uh, you weren't supposed to worship men back then. They were old-fashioned. They didn't understand what we know now. However, the following day, Good Friday, something amazing happened as well. The crucifixion, of course. Mm -hmm. But while we know the major things that came out of that, there was a minor thing. And that was just as Christ gave an example to all Catholic monarchs in humility. By dying on the cross for all of us, he gave an example to Catholic military men. Greater love hath no man than to lay down his life for his friends. Mm -hmm. And so, in a real sense, it was the birth of Catholic chivalry, Good Friday. And that's why devotion to the Holy Cross and the Feast of the Holy Cross was always such a big part of Catholic knighthood. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you may wonder why you... you Look at the Knights of Malta, or the, even the Templars, the Teutonic Knights. The symbol's always a cross. Yeah. Well, that's what it refers to. And that's why they always celebrated the, great, uh, the two great feasts of the Holy Cross in May and September. So, now you know. What does all this symbolism got to do with reality? Well, quite a bit. Because out of, uh, well, Good Friday and Monday Thursday, of course, together, give us the sacrifice of the Mass. Mm -hmm. Pentecost was the birthday of the Church. But from that time on, the Church was an organic body, you see. Mm -hmm. 
with its own government, its own rules, its own everything. But then a funny thing happened. For several centuries, as you know, we were an illegal organization in Rome. Uh, they would drag Catholics in front of the judge, and the judge would say, it is illegal for you to exist. That's kind of harsh. A little bit. Had a, had a Californian been present at the time and been brought up in front of the judge, he would have said, hey, man, you know, you're really harshing my mellow. <laughs> but They triggered me, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or, you know, I, I feel like I'm being really triggered here. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. But the end result of all this good stuff is that, as we know, in 311, Constantine uh, had his vision and eventually converted, and Catholicism became tolerated and favored. But 376 A.D., the Edict of Thessalonica by uh, Emperor Theodosius the Great, mm -hmm. by which, now, now mind you, in 303, Catholicism became the state religion of Armenia. A little after that, Ethiopia, Georgia, not, not Atlanta, oh, Georgia. Yeah. No, not, not Georgia on my mind. No, 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 A rain and night in Georgia. No, no, no. Not that Georgia. The one that gave us Joe gentlemen. Stalin. What's that? We're auditioning for uh, the voice for American Idol, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Georgia <laughs> named you. Georgia claimed you. Sweet Georgia Brown. All right, fine. Hot-hearted Hannah, the vamp of Savannah. Enough. <laughs> so... So at any rate, it was the other Georgia, the one that gave us Joe Stalin. Yes, that one. Not, not the one that gave us Hot Hot and Hannah. But James Brown. Yeah. <laughs> Stay back. Kiss myself. Oh gosh. The world is a sadder place without James Brown. Anyway, the uh, he felt good though. And he knew that he would all right, you know. <laughs> so, I know it. <laughs> you know, I've got all this this pop culture locked up in this head of mine, and it's all it was bad and irrelevant when it was new, and now it's just <laughs> anyway. So, uh, what should happen? But uh, Theodosius the Great did something very extraordinary. You may remember from the Bible and St. Paul that Roman citizenship was a special privilege that not too many people had. Mm -hmm. Theodosius the Great gave it to you upon baptism. So when you were baptized, you were not just a member of the church, you were a citizen of the empire. Mm -hmm. And from that time on, the concept of the holy empire as the temporal expression of the church, of the res publica Christiana, you know, but we have to bear in mind something. When we say empire, uh, uh, Americans just think of tyranny even though we're an empire ourselves, but I mean, at least we're locked down and can enjoy our freedom quietly. <laughs> can we not flog that particular very living horse? It's very upsetting. <laughs> anyway, uh, we think of the British Empire. We think of the French Empire. We think of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. God knows what Hitler did to the word Reich, which is the German word. Mm -hmm. But we have all of these unfortunate added connotations, which don't help us at all. And I mean, it's a little bit like if I say republic, and the first you think, the first thing you think of is Hitler getting elected. If that's, believe me when I tell you that if the first thing you think of is Hitler getting elected, when I say the word republic, your view of republics are going to be a little skewed. And then if you say, "Oh yeah, a republic," you mean like Haiti, and the president for life, Duvalier. No, that's not what I mean when I say republic. Idi Amin, Uganda? No. I mean the United States. But that's not like most republics. Well, all right, fine. The point I'm making is we have that same twisted, distorted view of the word empire. Mm -hmm. And to understand what the church meant by it and why and how the church dealt with it, we have to get that out of our heads. The way you pretty much have to get Hitler, Duvalier, and uh, Idi Amin out of your head if you really wanted to understand what a republic should be. That's kind of an important concept for us. So, uh, 
As it happened, Theodosius the Great was the last Roman emperor to rule both the East and the West. When the Germanic tribes invaded the Western Roman Empire, although we think of this as the fall of the empire, they did not. And when the Franks and then the Visigoths and so on became Catholic, they considered that they were simply subjects of the emperor. And even the man who overthrew the last emperor in the West, uh, a Germanic uh, soldier named Odoacer, sent the crown back to Constantinople and said, now we only have one emperor again. And so for quite a while, the emperors after that, the emperor in Constantinople was considered as the emperor, under which all the, the kingdoms of the Franks and the Visigoths and so forth considered themselves to be. Now, what that really consisted of is kind of intangible. And that's something that's important to understand about, well, pre-modern government. When we think of governments, we think of things like the one that we live under that can, you know, stick us away in the house for a while and can define right and wrong, can define marriage, can define the law, basically can make it up out of its own posterior as it likes. That's our idea of government, you know. If it doesn't have a secret police and it doesn't have an internal revenue, it must be pure anarchy. Mm -hmm. That's our, our modern attitude. And we, the, the uh, so-called free citizens, are for our masters, very much like cattle waiting to be milked. Mm -hmm. So we have to get that idea of governance out of our heads if we're going to understand the past. It's very important. Because for them, being loyal to a king or loyal to a lord did not mean that he owned you lock, stock, and barrel the way we're owned. And we tend to project our idea of government back into those days and sort of distort it. The truth of the matter is that we're with us. Uh, well, you've got to explain another concept. Authority versus power. It's very important. Authority is the right to say what ought to happen. Power is the ability to make it so. Mm -hmm. So your doctor, for instance, has the authority to prescribe a course of, uh, of treatment for you. Mm -hmm. But you're the one with the power to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference between medieval society and ours is that with them, power was very diffuse. The lords had some, the church had some, the guilds had some, the king had some, mm -hmm. even the peasants had some. It was all all over the place. But authority was very much concentrated in the church, in the sovereign. And in that sense, just as the Pope had a great deal of authority over the church, but not necessarily that much power, so, so too with the emperor, mm -hmm. who had authority, but not much power out of territories that were not directly under him. And the same was true for all of the kings of Europe as well. They had power over the territories that they ran themselves, but only authority over everything else. And the result of a setup like that was that a good king was like an orchestra leader who uses authority given by God via the church and, is, as, and symbolized by the coronation. Mm -hmm. um, he uses authority to have the different elements of the state work together. But a bad king, although he could make life unpleasant for the people immediately around him, he wasn't a despot. Instead, you, you wouldn't get ty tyranny. You would get anarchy. That was the mark of a bad king in those days. Yeah. So it's very different from us. With us, authority is diffuse because everybody can vote. But oh. power... Power is very concentrated. Now, if you wonder how I know power is concentrated, it's because we're all under lockdown. <laughs> Exhibit A. <laughs> Exhibit A, what you're actually going through right now. You know, I never want to hear people talk to me about absolute monarchy ever again. <laughs> Even Henry VIII couldn't do something like this. He couldn't redefine marriage. He had to pretend he was going according to the law. He, he had to, uh, there were all sorts of things that were simply beyond him. Our masters have no such problem. No, 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 no. So 
If you're going to talk about the despotisms of the past, ladies and gentlemen, shut up. Just mouth closed. Mouth closed. Because you don't know what despotism is. You're living under it, and you've never caught on. You didn't catch on when the Supreme Court changed the definition of human beings. That didn't... It didn't strike you that there was something wrong, that they could change something so fundamental. That didn't, you know, well, okay. And then they changed the nature of marriage. Now, that was a gradual thing, starting with divorce and then no-fault divorce. Mm -hmm. Um, Then, of course, gay marriage. And up until this exciting period, the whole gender revolution All that stuff, ladies and gentlemen. And yet, living through it, we still have the gall to look at the kings of old and call them despots. Mm -hmm. (laughs) No. (laughs) No. No. You know, the serfs, and they were the people who were the least appreciated in medieval society, they only worked 31 days a year for their lords. How much do you work for the Supreme Court or the sorry, the Internal Revenue again? Is it 212 days or something like that? Please, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yeah, never kid a kidder, please. It just, no. Anyway, I digress. So, uh, you have that situation then where the emperor in the East was considered to be the emperor of all of Christendom. And if you want an individual who epitomizes that, Justinian. Mm -hmm. He literally laid down the law. Ha, ha, ha. Gosh, never mind. Anyway, that's a very obscure joke, ladies and gentlemen. I can't promise you're going to get it. So (laughs) suffice to say that uh, after that, you had the Muslim uh, invasions, of course, and the... Respublica Christiana, the Christian Republic, as they say in Latin. Well, we lost North Africa. We lost Egypt. We lost uh, the Near East. We lost the Holy Land. We lost all these areas. And then Spain. Uh, And the Eastern emperors became very, very busy (laughs) dealing with the Muslims. So there wasn't a lot they could do in the West. And for the popes, this became a problem because you had a new people called the Lombards, Mm -hmm. come down. No, they were not led by Carol Lombard. (laughs) I don't know who comes up with this stuff. You need new material and new writers. Anyway, (laughs) so the Lombards invaded Italy, and they soon restricted the Byzantines to the cities, including Rome. But as I say, after that, the Muslims invade. The uh, emperor in Constantinople is less and less able to help the pope. And then the emperors turn iconoclasts. So the Pope is both religiously, politically, and militarily stuck on his own. He looks for a protector, and he finds it, the Franks. And they come down twice, first under Pepin, and then under Charlemagne, and smack the Lombards around. And so the Pope rewards Charlemagne by reviving the empire in the West and making him the emperor in 800. Christmas Day, 800. Another very monarchical feast, just like the Epiphany. Did I mention that? So the concept of the Holy Empire then and of the Renovatio Imperii, the renovation, the restoration of the empire in the West, is a very, very, very important part of Catholic theology and Catholic philosophy. Because again, the idea was that all Christian kingdoms were somehow part of one whole. And this was also why, as was as I said, uh, Theodosius made baptism entry into citizenship. Well, that was the way it was in all Christian kingdoms, which is why Jews, Muslims who lived outside the Muslim empire, and heretics were not citizens. They were outside the pale. Because the church and the state, while not the same thing, were different aspects of the same thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, one of the big problems that came about, of course, was that in the East, 
the imperial power swallowed up the ecclesiastical power. And in the West, you had a series of fights between popes and emperors that ended up doing neither of them any good. The Welfs of the Ghibellines, it was called in Italy. Um, and the result of it was the, uh, the destruction of the imperial power in the West. Uh, although the empire continued to limp on. Uh, my little joke is that in the West, the Guelphs pretty much won. So the imperial power was wrecked and everything was screwed up. In the East, the imperial power triumphed over the ecclesiastical power. So everything was screwed up and kind of wrecked. Yeah, there's, there's an implication here that neither turned out very well. <laughs> The um, another one of my jokes about the East and West, you know, is that in the West, in the Catholic West, uh, authority swallowed up tradition, and in the East, tradition swallowed up authority. <laughs> and the last of my little jokes in this area, if jokes they be, you know the difference between Catholics and Orthodox? No, I haven't heard this one. Catholics will tolerate any amount of heresy, but no schism. Orthodox will tolerate any amount of schism, but no heresy. <laughs> it's almost as though the two halves of Christendom were intended to act as correctives on each other's excesses. Mm -hmm. Like they were meant to be not. Nah, nah. I can't have that. Nah, forget what I said. <laughs> forget what I said. No, no, everything is just perfect the way it is in this best of all possible worlds, and it all turned out beautifully. But at any rate, uh, despite the despite the ongoing fights between popes and emperors, the, the imperial idea remained very very important in the West. Dante, of course, wrote about it, mm -hmm. and you remember the great schism mm -hmm. between the three popes. Mm -hmm. Well, who was it who put an end to it? It was the emperor, mm -hmm. Emperor Sigismund called the Council of Constance and said, okay, we've had three popes for 60 years. It's been a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think we're not going to do this anymore. So, yeah, I think uh, having one pope is like a good alternative and stuff. Yeah, that'd be nice. So you can thank Emperor Sigismund for the end of the Great Schism and no churchman. We don't like to remember that. We don't like to think about it. But we should. So, what happened then, you ask? I'm glad you did. Something really terrible that really broke the idea of the Holy Empire. And that was the Protestant Revolt. And the interesting thing is, it happened in the reign of the man who came close to restoring, the, he came the closest to restoring the idea of the Christian Empire of anybody since Charlemagne. And that was Charles V who ruled Austria, Burgundy in the Netherlands, Spain. He was Holy Roman Emperor. Under him, Mexico and Peru came into the empire, uh, the Philippines. It was said of Charles V, and he was the first one of whom it was ever said, that the sun does not set on his empire. I think last week I made a, uh, they, they, they had the joke about the British Empire was that the sun never sets on the British Empire because God doesn't trust them in the dark. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, but that was perhaps the apogee of the, of the practical idea. Unfortunately, the Protestant uh, revolt, the French alliance with the Turks, all that contributed to destroying it. He died a very disappointed man, left the empire to his brother and Spain and its possessions to his son, hence the House of Habsburg dividing into two branches. And um, the, the, in Protestant kingdoms, the very thing that had been the case in Catholic realms before, that membership in the church and citizenship were the same thing, mm -hmm. now got reversed on the Catholics. Everything that the Catholic Church in England, the Catholic Church in Sweden, the Catholic Church in the northern German principalities had been prior to the Protestant revolt now became the property of the established Protestant Church. 
So if you are not part of that church, you are not really a full citizen. That was true if you were Catholic. It was true if you were one of the dissenting sects. Mm -hmm. And you can still see bits and pieces of that idea in the settlement of America. I mean, specifically of the 13 colonies. Mm -hmm. um, in New England, you were not a citizen of the New England colonies unless you were a member of, an, a, of the Congregational Church. Mm -hmm. But it was the same idea. It's just that first the Catholics had it, then the Anglicans took it, and then when the uh, Puritans established their own godly commonwealth, the shining city on the hill, the last best hope of mankind, well, they kept the same laws. It's just the application was different. Yeah. <laughs> Even as today... If you don't support gay marriage, if you don't support abortion, you're not really a full citizen. You're not part of the established church. You are tolerated, but no more. Mm -hmm. yes. So, you see, the thing is, ladies and gentlemen, there's no such thing as separation of church and state. There can well be separation of my church and the state, or his church in the state. But every state has an animating philosophy that acts as the established church. It gives legitimacy and authority to the leadership. It provides the rules whereby people play. In the Soviet Union, it was communism. There is no God, and Lenin is his prophet. Mm -hmm. And it acted in the Soviet Union as a religion just the way Nazism did in Germany, and the way this weird, gooey thing that we're supposed to believe acts for us. I, it's, I, I don't really have an easy name for it. Uh, American post-Christianity? I don't know. Yeah. Whatever you want to call it, it definitely has tenets and practices and rules. And if you're bad, you'll be punished. So, moving along... Uh, the empire itself, of course, did survive the Protestant revolt of a sort of, kind of. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, now it was almost always the Habsburgs who had it, uh, although it was still formally an elective office. The, um, it became less and less and less until Voltaire made fun of it and said, it's neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. Everyone's heard that. But uh, it, was, it wasn't quite snuffed out until 1806. And in that year, uh, Francis II, who was afraid Napoleon would try to make himself Holy Roman Emperor, uh, he'd made himself Emperor of the French two years before. And so Francis was worried that he would try to snatch the crown from him. So in 1804, he declared himself Emperor of Austria. And then in 1806, he abdicated the Holy Roman throne and declared it over, absolved all his subjects and their allegiance and so on. But there's a funny thing about that. You know that just because you abdicate a throne or resign a presidency, you don't abolish the country. So in law, the empire continued, and I suppose continues as a sort of weird disembodied spirit. But wait, there's more. Uh, the, in the East, the uh, Byzantine Empire, which represented the Eastern tradition of the, of the empire, uh, survived until 1453, on the fall of Constantinople. But about 10 or so years later, the Pope of the time negotiated a marriage between the niece of the last Byzantine emperor and the Grand Duke of Moscow. And as a result of that marriage, ever since the, well, the Grand Duke of Moscow took the title of Tsar, Emperor, mm -hmm. Caesar, it's like Kaiser in German, mm -hmm. and basically claimed to be the successor of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, that's why they had what was called the theory of the three Romes. Mm -hmm. You may have heard this. Mm -hmm. uh, Rome was the first Rome, and it fell to the barbarians. Constantinople was the second Rome, and it fell to the Turks. Moscow is the third Rome, 
and there shall not be another. And until 1917, the, uh, the Russian czars, just like the Holy Roman Emperors and then later the Austrian Emperors, had the double eagle, which was the sign of Constantine's empire. The eagle looks east and west. Mm -hmm. And it also speaks for church and state. So anything that claims any kind of a connection with the old empire, we use the double eagle as a symbol. So the Serbs, the Albanians, they all use it because they were on the frontier against the Turks. And that, uh, the, the one exception to that rule is the 33rd degree of Freemasonry, which also uses it as their symbol. Hmm. And I, uh, I was very disappointed years ago when I was a, a little boy because I heard the John Philip Sousa march under the double eagle. And I thought this was yeah, well, some right. sort of pain to the Habsburgs, you know? Yeah. yeah. Not a bit of it. <laughs> nope, nope, nope. It was actually, uh, despite his Portuguese background, John Philip Sousa was a practicing and high-placed Freemason. Mm. And it was, uh, under the double eagle, his version is a hymn to Freemasonry. Oh, nice. It's as American as apple pie. Uh, What's not, not to love? <laughs> you beat me to the apple pie thing. <laughs> That's right. They go together in the good old USA, baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, and masonry. Uh, Chevrolet. <laughs> Chevrolet. Sorry, Mike. I, I get these seizures, you know. It's, it's being in isolation. It, 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 you'll have to excuse it's me. It's turning you mad, Charles. <laughs> What's that? It's turning you mad, Charles. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Let it all hang out. <laughs> no, I, I, I've, I've just, you know, while, we, while we've been uh, here, I've just been notified that the chancellor is talking about beginning, because the numbers, uh, the numbers of increase have gone down so severely in Austria. Uh, he's talking about uh, beginning to ease up on the restrictions. So we'll see what happens. But yeah. uh, he's, I think he's the first world leader to have talked about that. Probably, yeah. But I guarantee you, if they do, they're going to keep the borders sealed for quite a while. I and mean, restrict. If someone gets sick again afterwards, if the numbers start going up, do you shut everybody back in the doors? Well, that see, that's that's the thing. I, I mean, who knows? We'll find out. But anyway, I digress. We are bringing coming to a point, believe it or not. Ah, you didn't think I had one, but I do. <laughs> so, what should happen? But that uh, the uh, the uh, the Holy Roman Empire, as I say, was sort of a casualty of the Napoleonic Wars. But a very interesting thing happened at the end of them. And the thing that happened was that the victorious powers, to include France, had restored, restored as they had thought, monarchy, gotten rid of the French Revolution and Napoleon. They came up with something, which was actually the idea of the Tsar of Russia, Alexander I, the Holy Alliance in which all the sovereigns of Europe would bind themselves together to uh, peace and joy and ruling their peoples in accordance with the gospel. Well, that lasted about 15 years until the uh, 1830 revolution in France. But it was a nice idea. Uh, and after that, you had various movements, shall we say, for the establishment of some sort of supranational authority mm -hmm. that could act as an ultimate arbiter. Uh, and again, interestingly enough, it was the Russians, just like the Holy Alliance, it was Nicholas II who came up with the idea for the world court. Now, as you know, we had the two great world wars. Uh, the first one destroyed the last claimants to the uh, Imperium, both in East and West. Uh, the murder of the Tsar, and then, of course, the exile and dry martyrdom of uh, Blessed Emperor Carl. Mm -hmm. That was, to a great degree, the end, in a sense, of the practical application of the imperial idea. But it has continued to haunt Europe and Christendom. Uh, the founders of the European Union, uh, people like Robert Schumann, Alcide de Gasperi, and uh, Konrad Adenauer, all of whom, incidentally, have been looked into for beatification. They were very pious Catholics, and they thought of the idea to overcome the horrible nationalisms that had wrought such damage in the two wars. They thought of the idea of pulling together a sort of updated 
empire of Charlemagne. And that was their vision of the European Union. And it was very much blessed at the time and since by the church, starting with Pius XII. Uh, the other thing you'll find is that, uh, not so much the Pius XII, but certainly with John XXIII and everybody after, the post-war popes have also been very much in support of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. I suspect that, more so in the case of the EU, but even to the UN to a degree, this is a more or less unconscious yearning on the part of successive popes for some player to take the part of the Holy Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, again, a supranational entity capable of solving disputes between countries uh, before it comes to war. Now, whether or not those hopes are well-placed is a whole other kettle of fish. Uh, with the EU, the... Uh, what began as an almost explicitly Christian enterprise has become as anti-Christian in faith and morals as our own government. Mm -hmm. And like our own government, I mean, the founding fathers were a weird mixture of Protestant Christians and deists. Mm -hmm. They had both. I mean, one of the things is you'll have people pointing out, you'll have people say, well, the uh, the Founding Fathers were a bunch of uh, Freemasons and Deists. They're right. The Founding Fathers were a bunch of Bible-believing Protestants. They're right. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of Founding Fathers, you see. And those were the two, the uneasy thing that made up the group of them, mm -hmm. were those two currents. And those two currents have been with us in American life ever since. Again, in an uneasy balance, mm -hmm. uh, which for most of our history was made possible by, number one, a shared moral consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody believed more or less that the same things were right and wrong. And that transcended belief. Uh, the And then the other was the sort of religion of the country, mm -hmm. whereby we deified our founding fathers, we deify the Constitution and the Liberty Bell and all that, mm -hmm. and people of all religion or none could take part in its rituals. Mm -hmm. And that, those two things were what allowed the United States to function and become a great power. But the destruction of that moral consensus in the 60s and the gradual death of the religion of the country since then has put us in a position now where the dominant faith is this weird, gooey thing to which I referred earlier, um, whose tenets are always changing and whose rules are difficult to follow, but which you will be punished if you don't follow. So uh, one of the interesting things, too, though, is that the idea of the empire had a big effect on the United States, it's a, particularly its inception. Uh, even the idea of our electoral college is a direct steal from the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, and I, it's one of my favorite elements, by the way, of our Constitution. I, uh, years ago, I was in the bar at uh, Union Station in L.A., and it was the election year, and this guy was holding forth on how terrible the Electoral College is, and people should be able to vote directly, and blah, 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 blah. And I listened to him. You know, I heard him go on and on and on. I said, well, let me ask you, pal, where are you from? He said, I'm from Kansas. I said, really? That's sweet. Very cute. Quaint. Well, let me ask you a question. Do you feel that only the people of California, New York, Texas, and Florida should decide who will be president of the United States? Well, no, of course not. Oh, oh. well, you see, here's the little problem you've got. If it weren't for the Electoral College, nobody would give a damn about flyover country. <laughs> Instead of having to pretend they give a damn about you every four years so they can bamboozle you out of your votes, they could just say, shut up, cram it, clowny. I'm going to go where the real action is and where people matter. And believe you me when I tell you that ain't Kansas. <laughs> sure ain't Kansas. <laughs> and he looked at me, and then he switched, and he was going on about how wonderful the Electoral College was. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah. And I... 
with just uh, just as vociferous. Well, you know, the, I'm sure the booze helped. But he was going on about the greatness of the Electoral College when I left. And I thought to myself, my work here is done. <laughs> but uh, one thing you learn about life, as my late father used to say, is that most people really don't have much of an opinion about anything, but they do love to talk about it. Anyway. My dad had one like that, but so, I can't say it on air. <laughs> Well, but the the good news, and there's always good news if you twist your head a little bit, uh, is that, as I say, the desire for the empire is still there. And there are bits and pieces, remnants of it, lying around. Um, it's an idea that is perennial, because... Just as the Holy Roman Empire, or the empire in the West, was an interregnum for 400 years until Charlemagne came along, you have uh, people like Father Aidan Nichols, OP, uh, one of the, actually my favorite living theologian, talking about ways in which we could look at the issue again for current, the current day. But the important thing to bear in mind is that that empire, like the church itself, actually started from the bottom up. It was 300 years of the Christianization of Rome that led to the creation of the Holy Empire, and it's, it's being fixed in our heads. Before anything like that, in my humble opinion, could really take off, barring some unexpected bolt from the blue, which history is filled with, so... You know, one of, one of the things is that while the firmest foundation is from the bottom up, there's another way. That's from the top down. Yeah. And, you know, as you saw in Protestant countries, as you saw in Muslim countries, mm -hmm. uh, if you even just make it a little more difficult for people to advance unless they join the dominant faith, in a few generations, you'll run the show. Mm -hmm. You'll be the majority. Don't fret. Uh, because unfortunately, the majority of people at any given time are not really too committed to anything except their comfort and safety mm -hmm. as they see it. Mm -hmm. um, the proof of the pudding, and, and again, I never again ever want to hear anyone, any modern person, ask how people could have gone along with the Nazis or the communists or anything else. Because you're doing it. And no, I'm not saying there's a moral equivalency here. I'm not. And that would be ridiculous. What I'm saying is the same basic human impulses guide us as they guided our ancestors. So what's wonderful about this time is that it can answer for you an historic question. If at any given moment you look at a historical episode and say to yourself, well, how could people have just get along with it? Look around. The way we do. And there were reasons for it for them too. And I would be the last to say we're wrong. Because you know what? I honestly don't know. But I can tell you. We would rather be safe and comfortable than free. Mm. And even that, even that word free, we can't define. We've been taught that it means able to do anything you want. That's not what true freedom is. Freedom is the ability to do what is right and to live your life according to God's law in a place that tries to live according to God's law. Yeah. If you live in a place that does not, you are not free. Even if you can perform any vice that comes to your mind. Mm -hmm. So, in bringing it all to a conclusion, I give you this to think about. I've said that the empires and kingdoms and governments of the past were far looser than what we're used to. Hard to argue with just at the moment. 
but it's true. Mm-hmm. What of the future? Why is it that in so many jurisdictions around the world, churches are unessential, but abortions are? These are the questions, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have to ask when you get out of stir. But don't think your masters will appreciate your asking them. And don't think that if you ask them forcefully, there won't be any blowback. However, if it's any consolation to you, you can always rely on uh, on two things, really. One, uh, do you remember A Man for All Seasons? Mm -hmm. Well, the play and the television version, not the movie version, the television version with Charlton Heston has a character who is actually almost all the minor characters. He's the steward for Thomas, uh, Thomas Moore. He's various messengers. You know, you keep seeing the same guy as all sorts of uh, bit figures, bit players running back and forth. But he actually epitomizes the common man. And at the end of the play, at the end of the movie, see the Charlton Heston version, he gives a roll call of what happened to everybody how they were executed or how they died. Or, so, so and so, so and so. Oh, well, he was beheaded on Tower Hill, uh, November 13th, 1549. And so and so, so and so died of dysentery. You know, and it just gives this long roll call. And then he goes, And me? Bearing in mind that he's every man. And me? Oh, I died in my bed, as I hope shall all of you. I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, we are all of us far more like the steward than we are like any of the other characters in that play. And so I can finish by giving you a motto with which to respond to your rulers when this is all over. Are you ready? <laughs> I got the Here beat it button is. Ready. I got the beat button ready. <laughs> Just kidding. Here it is. Be ready. Ma- 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 Believe me, just, it's the most wonderful thing they'll be able to hear from you. Just look at the TSA line. Old Massa de Coco Ground. <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I hope, I'm sorry that was a bit of a downer, but <laughs> You know, you look you look at the characters of the history that we've gone through. People like Blessed Charlemagne, Otto the Third, Saint Henry the Emperor, Justinian, Blessed Constantine the Eleventh, the last of the Byzantine emperors who died fighting the Turks in 1453, and is a blessed. Uh, blessed Charlemagne, of course. Blessed Charles the First, and tons of others. Imperial history gives you a plethora of admirable folk to look at. What's a good, Just don't try emulating them. What's a good resource or a few books so that people can read to learn more about that? Okay, I could do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, you want, you, you want me to tell you now? All right, fine. Uh, <laughs> well, the best book in English is a book uh, called very, uh, very, uh, what's the word I want? Conveniently. Uh <laughs> It's called The Holy Roman Empire by James Bryce. Now, there's a second book I can recommend uh, called The Holy Roman Empire by Friedrich Heer, H-E-E-R. There is a third book I cannot recommend more highly. I think it's out of print, so you got to go scrambling. There's a website dedicated to it. But it is by the self-same uh, Father Aidan Nichols, O.P., and it's called Christendom Awake. I really, really have to recommend that book. Um, it's really quite good. And let me see, beyond that. No, I think that, that, that'll about do it. Okay. Uh, I'll get everyone past the quarantine time. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Of course, unless you're in Austria, I mean, so if if we are let out of stir next week, 
you know, uh, the sad thing is, if we are out of stir, I see you next week, I'll be like, hey, <laughs> how you doing there, pal? Land of the free, home of the brave, huh? <laughs> you better hope we stay under lockdown, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, this, this, I'm going to be impossible, You're you know. Oh, I, in the background. Yeah. Oh, man. You know, so how's that spirit of 76 doing before you, pal? Got to wave the stars and stripes a little, huh? <laughs> oh, man. You better hope you guys get out before we do. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'm just going to, I'm going to be so full of it. The the ego will be pouring out. I, 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 I can't imagine. <laughs> it, it's it's, it's going to be bad. So you better be, you write your governor. <laughs> <laughs> you, your governor, you tell your governor that if Austria gets out, North Carolina needs to get out, you know, so that at least I can't make Tar Heel jokes. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, so what you going to do, secede, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. You don't need yeah. that garbage from me. I, I'm a South Carolinian, but living, oh, in, living in the North, very these nice. Guys put no secession in their state constitution. North Carolina did. There was apparently a guy running for office a couple of years ago on that ballot to get rid of that amendment. Who's the who's the dope that put that one in? It was probably Reconstruction. Probably. But but you know what North Carolina has always called itself? Go for it. A valley of humility between two mountains of conceit. <laughs> I. I, uh, you know, next time we should probably talk about the South. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. I mean, not just the Confederacy, but the whole Southern thing. Yeah, yeah. That's you cool. know, Flannery O'Connor, Southern Gothic, Faulkner, the whole, the whole nine yards. Uh, Walker Percy. Uh, hey, yeah, nice. yeah. Okay. I mean, and, and uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston. You yeah. know, we'll get the black experience in there. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, well, you know what? We'll we'll be there with the old folks at home. Hey, <laughs> God, they're not doing anything either. <laughs> we'll get your lemonade, sweet tea ready, and get some. We're up the street. We got some boiled peanuts. I'll have some for that for next time. <laughs> I've, I've got uh, I've got peanuts here. What uh, uh, I could do? So you know what? I really, really there's certain things I miss over here. Honestly, mm -hmm. food wise. Chinese food I got plenty of. Vietnamese I got over here. Mm -hmm. I don't miss that because I've got it. What I miss, three things. I miss Mexican food. Oh, yeah. Badly. Yeah. I miss uh, corned beef and pastrami. Uh -huh. And I miss fried chicken. Uh -huh. I mean... I mean, <laughs> gosh. Well, I, I actually, you know what? I, I and I miss I miss Louisiana food. You know, gumbo and jambalaya and stuff like that, which you can't get here either. Now, fortunately, I love the food here. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, don't don't think I'm starving by any any means. But you just can't get what I mentioned, and it it that's a, you know one of the funny things about being over here. Um, you know, I've, I've always loved the United States, which makes people kind of shocked because of my, shall we say, low opinion of the historical roots of its form of government. I hear it all the time. But what's up? I hear that to me all the time, too. Yeah, well, uh, firstly, when someone says that to me, I have to restrain my initial thought, which is, oh, really? I took the oath and served in the armed forces. How about you, smart guy? you know, than the crickets. But the truth of the matter is it's I don't love about our country. I don't love the, the shining city on the hill with the last best hope, all that stuff. It was never true anyway. I, I have no use for it. But I love the country as it is. You know? Mm -hmm. The places, the people, mm -hmm. the food, mm -hmm. the the country that, yeah, I mean, this is the country that invented the cocktail mm -hmm. and the Broadway musical and, and 
the golden age of Hollywood. Uh, again, these weren't, and, and, and don't get me started on medicine and inventions and so forth. We produced Thomas Edison. Um, none of this is high culture or really great, 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 great stuff, but it's bloody good. Mm -hmm. And of course, the country that produced it was the country of my birth, the country my fathers came to. And I love it more than life itself. Um, I think one of the big problems is that we don't have a patriotism based upon the country. We have the dying embers of that state church. Um, and people saying things like, well, if America isn't, isn't good, she can't be great. What does that even mean? Mm -hmm. Countries aren't good. They're, they're what they are. Uh, well, I, I can't, uh, if America doesn't live up to the American dream, she's no good. Oh, really, smart guy? Really? Well, I've always felt that way. But being over here, and mind you, I love Austria. I love Europe. It's where we came from. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is something we try to forget. But it's true. Mm -hmm. Americans are Europeans who live across the sea and are all mixed. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like Canadians and South Africans and Brazilians. That's what we are. Mm -hmm. But all of that having been said, my... Uh, much as I love Europe and much as my love for Europe has increased, if that were possible, while I've been here, so is my love of the United States. Out of each of our regions and the, the states that make her up, I've been in all 50 states. And that's another thing that so many people who yap about, uh, oh, well, you can't love the country if you don't love her government. Well, cram it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, have, I have absolutely no use for you. <laughs> Uh, but as a Catholic, I want to see our country become Catholic so that she can go from being what she is now, which is sort of the Pinocchio of the nations, you know, not quite a real boy, and become whatever it is God has intended for her to be. That's what I want to say. And I do believe that if that ever happened, we could produce things as great as they ever did in Europe. Well, that Bishop Hughes' line of our, our job is to convert the government, the army, the military, Congress, everyone in the states. Yeah, absolutely. And that that is our job, which, with very few exceptions, we've had no use for from the uh, beginning of independence. The tragedy of the United States is not simply that they are a non-Catholic country. It is that their Catholics betrayed them. That sounds like a topic for another show. No, yeah, it does. We get into well, we'll, Americanism, my favorite topic. <laughs> well, I mean, Americanism. You know, there's the great, the great paradox. Mm -hmm. By embracing Americanism, we betrayed the, we betrayed America. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it's it's it's. A little bit like uh, a teacher not wanting to disturb her first graders by teaching them the alphabet. Mm -hmm. You know, the poor dears, they don't really know anything about that, you know, and they'd be very upset. Think of how hard it would be for them to realize that they can't read. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Teaching them to read is what you're supposed to be doing. Well, yes, but you know they never have. And they've got so many other things they can do. They can listen to films. They can listen to audio books. I don't see why they should be forced to read when they don't know how. That has been American Catholicism's view of America. Yeah. And we have betrayed our country. And yes, that's something we're going to go into. Yeah. But I want to hit the South first. We can, no problem. Just right, make so, sure that what? next time we do it, I want to make sure you have a plate of fried chicken in front of you. Darn right. Well, 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 well it's the Friday. Friday. Oh, it's going to be Friday. Well, good Friday. <laughs> but I, 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 I can have it at least in front of me. I'll, I'll eat it after. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> eat, eat it after Saturday. Vespers on Holy Saturday or something. I don't know. But no, there should be a pile of fried chicken just looking at me, you know, so I can. You can see me slather. I, uh, I'll leave you with this. 
Years ago, I was in Ireland on a uh, on a lecture tour, and I love Irish food, but you know it's very heavy. Mm-hmm. And every this is back in '93, and every day, well, you know they have what they call a full a full uh, fry up for breakfast, which is bacon. I mean Irish bacon, not the streaky stuff. Mm-hmm. Sausages, blood pudding, uh, eggs, uh, potatoes, all this stuff. And I ate this every day because see, they used to eat it every day when they were farmers. Mm-hmm. Now it's only for Sundays or a special occasion when you have a guest in your house. Mm-hmm. I was a guest at some house every day. So every breakfast I had was a full fry up. And I was getting pretty tired of it. I mean, it's great, mm-hmm. but I, I, and I was in Galway. <laughs> What's that? Mercy. <laughs> Well, I, I was in Galway, and this, this older lady was showing me around the downtown. And suddenly I saw a Chinese takeaway. And it's the only time in my life I literally began to slather. The saliva began pouring out of my mouth. And I just uh, I had to go to it. And she was like, uh, Mr. Kolob, is everything all right? Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. But you know what I ended up having? Oh, chow made and chips. <laughs> <laughs> chow made and french fries. Chow made and chips. Yeah. That's. But you know, the the chips were all right, but the chow made. It, even though it didn't taste like any chow made I'd ever had, I didn't care. <laughs> I was shoveling that stuff in my mouth. Oh, great stuff. Well, right. anyway, with that, uh, Take care of yourself, and we'll see you next week and explore the Southern Psyche. Sounds great, Charles. Take care. All right.